Gary. You may be seated. Well, I'm glad you're here. Um, usually when it rains, you know, I mean, some people must stay home and try to plant flowers. Well, I got some water or something. Um, fair weather followers or, and such. But you're here. That's great. Give, let's give the people around you a, an applause for being here. Let's thank them. Last week we were looking at that classic statement from Paul um, that we want to let that be a part of us as we, as we go along in this series that we're in. And the idea is that we're, you know, if we, if we remember and hide that word in us, that it becomes a strength, a source of an, an anchor, um, a source of power within us. And last week we looked at verse in Romans 8, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. Remember that? And we know that all things, that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. And so part of what we said last week was things happen, right? And, and it happens to everybody, good things and bad things. It happens to all of us. There's no separation uh, when, of things happening because it happens to everybody. But we also said that in those things, God works. God's at work in the midst of those things, and that's good news. It's good news that God is involved in the good things. It's good that God is involved in the things that are not good. God is at work in those things, and God wants to produce good things. And part of what that verse says is God wants our character to be like the character of Jesus. And that's what his work, that's what it means to be a disciple. That's the work that he does inside of us. He wants to take bad stuff and make good stuff out of it, right? We talked a little bit about that. Um, but he's at work for good even for people who don't even know or love him. God is at work in their lives. And so we can know this. We don't have to just guess or hope because we can actually live in that knowledge because we know it's true. The New Testament talks about this and gives us insight in this. And this is something that God gives us, and it's important because we can't control everything, right? There's a lot of things we can't control in life when things happen. But the good news is that in the midst of stuff, healing happens. Um, have you ever, the, our micro, microwave quit, and, uh, and so I started looking at microwaves to replace them, and the thing wasn't, you know, it, you know, as they go, it's just like right out of warranty. And uh, so I started looking at trying to replace it, and you know, then you got to decide, well, is this time to get one under the counter or on the counter or in the counter or behind the counter, in front, of, you know, and couldn't really find what. Anyway, I thought, I wonder if I could fix this. I wonder if I could fix this. And so I did a little reading, and... Um, one of the things I found out, and this is nothing in my sermon, this is free, this is added value, is it had tamper-resistant torque screws. There's a little peg in the center that you can't get a torque bit in unless you've got a tamper-resistant torque bit. So then I had to go find tamper-resistant torque bits that fit tamper-resistant torque screws. Found some. Make a long story short, I got that thing apart, took the fuse out of it, went to Radio Shack. They had the fuse. Put it back in, put it back together. Guess what? Thing worked. It worked. $3.78. I, I. The other day I was doing a chore around the house and I hit my thumb. And uh, have you ever done hit a a nail you, you know how that hurts you know 
And it's amazing the healing response that happens when you, do, when you injure, your, injure yourself like that. Immediately, the, the nerve and pain receptors are shooting the signal up to your brain instantaneously. Idiot, don't do that again. And then you have these little hematoma where the, where the blood, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's gathering around the wound and it turns purple and it begins. You have a, a response and all of these things, I was going to give you the whole list of what happens when you hit your thumb with a hammer and then you know, it turns blue and all that. I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a medical response that your body makes to bring healing to that point of injury. There's two things I learned about that. The first one is, these are important, so you might want to write these down. The first one is, Never do chores around the house that involve a hammer. Or really any chores at all because you could be damaged and then your ability to be with your spouse would be lessened and they would not appreciate you for not being able to be with them. So that the logical end of that is just don't do chores, right? This making sense to y'all yet? The second thing I learned about those things is that healing happens and it's not under my control it's not always what I want it's not always what I would have chosen it's not always how I would want to do it uh, sometimes when we're wounded uh, there's a response a healing response but there's also a scar that's left or sometimes there is a limp. And it's an amazing thing about our world that healing happens. And it's not just in the body. It's in the earth, too. When there's been a tremendous fire, um, everything is scarred and charred and ugly. And then like a miracle, things start to pop up from the earth. Green sprouts, and they start shooting up. Beverly's brother was a botanist and uh, uh, he had his doctoral degree from Harvard in botany and he used to go out on the prairie and he would tell me about the eco ecological system of the just the Oklahoma prairie that uh, fire triggers growth and sometimes without the fire you know the new growth doesn't happen but the heat releases the seeds and it replenishes the prairie New life starts with that. The healing happens with that. It's like God somehow built healing into the way the earth responds. Healing happens. This group of people, small group of little people, not little in size, but in terms of numbers, called Israel a long time ago, came to believe that this was something really significant about the kind of person their God is. One of the ways that you can divide people, a lot of times, you can either divide people either as savers or throwers, right? You can look at a family group. Somebody in that family group will either be a saver or a thrower. And um, every marriage has that separation. Some years ago, we got some goldfish for our kids. And that's when they're really small, and you know, kids like to watch goldfish, and da, da 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 da. And so we noticed that one of the fish in the tank was real listless, and like didn't have a lot of life in them. And I said something to Bev. I don't think that fish is doing well. And Bev immediately said, "Well, get rid of it. Flush it down the stool, and we'll get a new one." I said, "Okay." And then. There was this chair that my dad had given me. It had been in the family a long time, and the upholstery was kind of bad, and arm was broken, and Bev said, that chair is not doing well. And then she said, get rid of it. We'll get a new one, just like that one is. And the next day, I had a cold, and I wasn't doing well, and I decided not to say anything to Beverly because I knew what category she was in. Y'all know what I'm saying? Huh? In Israel, they came to believe that God is a saver, not a thrower. 
And when God makes stuff and it breaks down, he wants to save it. That means God is a healer. That's why healing happens. They would express this in the most amazing ways. God says to Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt. This is in Exodus 19. And how I carried you, now here, see this vision, how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Exodus 19.4. That's a beautiful picture, isn't it? of God's intervention, of their perception of God's intervention in their lives. Can you think and see this mama eagle, and she's got a little eaglet, and, and it's too small to fly, or it has a bad wing, and somehow she tucks it under her big wing and flies off and protects that eagle. And that image, that picture of God's wing, of God's protection like an eagle became a powerful image in Israel. There's a guy named Ray Vanderland that talks about this. Some of you all have used some of his uh, Bible study material. And it's this important image of God's protection and God's healing. In Psalm, Psalms 91.4, it says, Under his wing you will find refuge. And there's a really cool word in the original biblical language, Hebrew, for the word wing. Uh, like the wing, like the, it's the, the wing under God. It's God's wing. And the word is kanaf, kanaf. And it's also the word, now follow along with this, that's the word for wing in Hebrew, it's also the word they use for the corner of a garment, kanaf. A devout Jew, a rabbi, would always wear a prayer shawl. Maybe some of you have seen them with the prayer shawl and the kanaf sticking down, little tassels. Y'all look like you're not sure what I'm talking about. Just follow they still wear this. And at the bottom of the prayer shawls, I've got one I should have brought out to you. Uh, there'd be these tassels, all kinds of tassels that would remind them of the commandments of God because those commandments were something that offered them the protection and healing of, of God. Rabbis would often eventually come to talk about this. We obey these commandments because they exist for the healing of the world, they would say. And the little, that little corner of the prayer shawl was called a kanaf. And over time, this wonderful tradition developed. This idea was born in Israel. It's stated in Malachi 4, verse 2, Unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. Over time, those ideas in Israel became more and more prevalent that someday a Messiah would come. And in his kana, in his prayer shawl, in the corner of his garment, there would be the healing of his wings. This idea has been around for a long time. Can you all remember singing about this? Anybody? There is a song that we sing at Christmas time. The title of the song is Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And there's a verse in that song, one line that says, Light of life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. That's in your Christmas song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And so it's not only the Hebrews that had that image. It's an image in Christian community as well. Healing happens. They believe this in Israel. And every once in a while, God would act in remarkable ways and there would be healings and miracles that would happen sort of randomly throughout the Bible, periodically in different situations with different people. When God was going to reveal something about the kingdom of God, like when he named uh, Hezekiah, Hezekiah was healed, or a guy that's not even a, an Israelite 
named Naaman is healed of leprosy. You remember that story? Healing happens. One day a rabbi named Jesus came into the world. He was a teacher and he was a healer. And this healing ministry was fundamental. Healing was fundamental to the ministry of Jesus. That ministry of healing was a foretaste of what God was going to do when God finally heals all of the world. We hear in Scripture the discussion of the new earth, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. And this is an old story. It says, a very large crowd followed and pressed around him, Jesus, and a woman who was there had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had on those doctors. And yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. This gives you a glimpse of the backstage world of the gospel writers for a moment. This is the gospel of Mark, and the story is told in each of the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's, it's interesting. This is a little value added that in Luke's gospel he doesn't mention that she went to all those doctors and she didn't have any money you have any idea why Luke, Luke would huh Luke was a doctor he was covering his profession right go back and read it uh, Luke doesn't mention this but Mark does now I want you to imagine this for a minute let's just Use the power of your imagination with me for a second. Imagine being this woman. Twelve years. She suffered physically. She's depleted. Anemic. She's weak. She's been bleeding. No energy. She suffers financially. She's lost all of her money. Everything's gone. She might even be a beggar now. We're not sure. She suffers spiritually as well. Because you see, the law in the Old Testament is such that it's clear about this. If she was in a state where she had a problem with, with bleeding, constant bleeding, then that would mean that she is unclean. So what does that mean? That means that nobody could touch her because she was unclean. That means that the bed where she slept was unclean. The chair on which she sat was unclean. If you sat on the chair that she had sat on, then guess what that means about you? You're unclean. There would be this stigma attached to her, this of uncleanliness, that she was not clean. She would, have had, she would have heard as she was living in the community, she would have heard stupid things people would say to somebody who is suffering like that. Well, if you'd have had enough faith, you wouldn't have suffered. This wouldn't be happening to you. Or you, you must be a sinner or you must have done something wrong. God must be displeased with you for something. And she's got to live with this for 12 years. Maybe she's a mom. Maybe this is caused because of childbirth and she's a mom. And most women in that day were mothers. You know what that means? She could not touch her children because her children would be unclean. Imagine never being able to tuck your kids into bed at night, never being able to give them a hug if a, one of your kids has a whack on the finger with a hammer. And they'll bring, what, are they, what, what, what usually happens to a little kid when he gets hurt? What's the first thing he does? Mama, mama, runs to mama. 
And what do they want from mama? Huh? Kiss it. Kiss it to make it better, mama. Maddox usually has mama kiss it, and then he gets an Iron Man Band-Aid or a Spider-Man Band-Aid or a Batman Band-Aid or some adventure figure Band-Aid after he gets the kiss. So they want it to be kissed. Every morning when she wakes up, and maybe some of you know what this is like, she thinks maybe today I'll be healed. Because she has this belief, because she is an Israelite, she believes that even in her uncleanliness, that God still has the capacity to heal her because God is a healing God. Maybe she's married or was, and no longer because she's unclean. And so she gets up every morning with the idea that maybe this morning is the day, maybe today. And then as the day goes on, she realizes it's not time, not today. And then she hears of this rabbi coming to town, Jesus, and she knows he is a healer, and he's coming there. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him, it says, in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his cloak, I will be healed. She gets this crazy scheme in her, in her mind. She hears of this healer coming, and she thinks, if I can touch him, I can get something good from him. Kind of a loose association. And there's this woman you may remember this, there was a woman in early days of TV. And she'd come up with these crazy schemes that when a celebrity came, she'd kind of disguise herself just to get close to the celebrity. Her name was Lucy. Uh, you remember the show I Love Lucy? Huh? And she'd do all these crazy schemes to get close to somebody that was going to be on the show. And she'd dress up in funny costumes and come up with all kinds of harebrained ideas and she'd disguise herself and sneak around and and of course Ricky would always find out right Ricky Ricardo her husband and and when he found out he would say to Lucy you got some explaining to do you got some explaining to do well this woman you might call her Lucy gets this crazy idea is I'm going to track Jesus down I'm going to sneak up behind him I'm going to come up I'm going to touch his cloak and I'm going to get some healing. And she, she approaches him from behind. And all three of the gospel stories tell this detail in the same way. And she came up from behind him. You, know, you want to know why? Because she was afraid. And she says, I want to touch him. Touching is something that we'll often do with somebody when we want something from them. We went to Scott's Thursday. It was his 40th birthday. Had a surprise gathering at his office, and then went out to dinner. And, uh, and so all of the grandkids were there except Maddox. And, uh, and so I observed this. When the grandkids wanted something, the touch was involved. And usually with... Uh, verbosity mama 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 and then would touch her and pat her and touch is always involved with something that we want and moms are a lot of times resistant and sometimes kids just wear them down right and finally said go on do it yeah you can have it there's something about touch though if you get a little bored in this sermon this morning just reach over to the person next to you that you don't know. Just reach out and just touch them. That will kind of wake things up a little bit for you. I mean, there's some power in touch. Just try that and see what happens. And then after service is over, uh, then later today, just call me. You don't have to stick around. Uh, just call me and let me know how that went. This woman gets this idea, 
if I can just touch his clothes, why does that thought, so let me ask you this question, why does that thought occur to her? You have to understand that it's not just touch his clothes that matters. It's the corner of his garment. It's the part of his prayer shawl. It's the kanah, kanaf. And maybe this woman is thinking out of everyone in Israel, maybe she's the only one that's getting this and putting this together. If this is the one we're waiting on, the Messiah with healing in his wings like we've been taught all of our lives, if I touch his kanaf, the corner of his garment, if I could just touch the corner of his garment, and she looks at Jesus, and she touches him, and then this amazing thing happens. Here's the way it reads. Immediately, her bleeding stopped. And she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. This is an unbelievable moment, an electric moment. All of a sudden, she has this experience where she remembers what it feels like to be normal, what it feels like to be whole what it feels like to be well. And she thinks, I got what I came for. I got healed from Jesus, and that's the end of the story, but it's not. At once, Jesus realizes that power has gone out from him, and he turns to the crowd, and this huge crowd, and he asks, who touched my clothes? See, people were crowding against you, the disciples respond. And you're asking who touched you? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had touched it, who had touched his cloth, his, his garment. And then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear. This is an incredible story because it gives us some insight into Jesus in this way. Because what we see in Jesus is both, on the one hand, his remarkable power, and on the other hand, his humanity, right? So what do I mean by that? We see this healing strength that goes out, and he knows it. We don't know if it comes, if this insight comes from God, but in that instant, we, he knows that power has gone out of him to someone. And the human part of him is this, is he doesn't know who got it. He doesn't know who it is. He's got the power to give, but he can't discern who it was that touched him that received the power. And he says, who touched me? And the disciples go, you're kidding, right? And they're looking at all of these people all over the place and say, what do you mean who touched you? Everybody's touching you, Jesus. You got to be crazy. And he looks around, and this one woman knows. And she looks at Jesus, and Jesus, Jesus looks at her, and Jesus says, Lucy, you got some explaining to do. And she falls at his feet, and she's scared to death because she has broken the law. She's broken the law. And she knows it. She made Jesus unclean by touching him. I, I don't know if you, if you get the unclean thing very, very well. It's so different from our, their culture to our culture. This is huge. She's broken the law. She's made Jesus unclean. And then there's this remarkable phrase. She told, listen, what it says. She told him the whole truth. I 
I wonder what that was. She told him the whole truth. I'd love to have been there for that. That little word whole, the whole truth. I just want to say a word to all of you. If there's anybody here that needs to be healed, we're moving toward healing today. And you don't really get healed with Jesus without bringing the whole truth. Are you following me? She just falls at his feet. Whatever it is for her, that whole truth, Jesus, I gave up so long ago maybe, and we can guess. Jesus, I, I, I haven't had enough faith. I haven't really believed. I haven't prayed like I should. I haven't been the kind of mom that I know I should have been. I haven't, I haven't done well with my money. I have no money at all. I feel like such a, a failure physically and a failure financially, and I feel like such a failure spiritually. The whole truth. And then she waits. She's terrified because she doesn't know what's going to happen she broke the law she made him unclean and he's a rabbi what's he gonna do what is Jesus gonna do the rabbi and she's shaking and this is Jesus and then he says this daughter and I can imagine that nobody's called her daughter for a long time. And he calls her daughter and he says, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be free from your suffering. When he says daughter, there's a meaning behind that. Because what he's saying, what he's implying, is she's a daughter of Israel. And more deeply than that, she's a daughter of God. She's no outcast. She's a daughter of God. And I was wondering when I was going through this story, is why does Jesus do this? Why does he respond to this woman this way? This woman's got healing. She's got what she wants. Why? She's been suffering. She got healed. She got what she was looking, looking for. Why does Jesus take this time to embarrass her? Why does he put her on the spot? Why does he make her talk with him face to face in front of this crowd? What's going on? And here's the reason, I think. It's because Jesus wants her to have more than just physical healing. He wants her to know, listen, he wants her to know the healer. Something inside, Jesus says, this is the kind of woman I would like to get to know. Somebody said this quote, let me share it with you. With Jesus, it's not okay to be okay. With Jesus, now listen, with Jesus, everybody is welcome. With Jesus, nobody's perfect. With Jesus, anything is possible. With Jesus, that means here, that means us, that means this church. It means it's okay not to be okay. You don't have to be okay. In fact, Jesus kind of specializes in people who are not okay. In fact, people who are okay don't always do real well with Jesus. Because, let me just tell you, if you go back to the beginning of this story, how did the story start? We didn't read that scripture to you. Maybe I should have. Sherry read the part about the woman with the issue of blood being healed. But the story actually starts with Jairus 
asking Jesus to go heal some member of his family. And so Jesus is going to Jairus' house. And then this woman on the way to Jairus' house comes up and touches Jesus' garment and she's healed. We sometimes call this a double healing. It's a healing on the way to a healing. So what's going on here? Jairus was an important guy. He was a leader in the synagogue. He had a household. He was somebody. This woman was anonymous. Nobody knew her. She was a nothing in their culture. Here's the contrast between the two. Jairus got to Jesus first. By this time, Jairus is thinking, when this lady comes up and touches Jesus, Jairus is probably thinking, hey, lady, take a number. I got here before you got here, right? Let's continue the contrast. Jairus is a man. His name is Jairus. Jairus has money. He has servants. He has people that wait on him. He has status. He's a leader in the community. He's a leader in the synagogue. On the other hand, this woman, in the second story, she's a woman. What's the first guy's name? Jairus. What's the lady with the issue of blood? What's her name? She's anonymous. We don't even know what her name is. She has no status. She has no money. She's given everything that she has away to doctors. And she is unclean. And we have Jairus, a somebody. And we have an anonymous woman, a nobody. And Jesus interrupts the somebody to be with the nobody. Can you see what that's telling us about the gospel? With Jesus, listen, with Jesus, nobodies become somebodies. With Jesus, the first become last. This is an incredible story for where it's going and its involvement with Jairus in this whole scene. Jairus is somebody. Now listen, in the kingdom of God, nobodies become somebodies. And in the kingdom, nobody is a nobody. In the kingdom, you're not a nobody. Because here's what happens. Are you ready? For we know in all things God works for the good for those who love him. And that's what happens. Where do you need to be healed today? Where do you need God's touch in your life? Our God is a healing God. You've heard me talk about uh, Beverly and I having marriage trouble and leaving the ministry and uh, working for a health care company. And as I've reflected over that, over the years, um, what I've realized is that part of our trouble was a wound in me that created a wound in her from growing up as a kid that I'd never dealt with the wound in me. Uh, John Eldridge calls it a father wound. And, and it caused me to be distant from her at times or blow up. And then, you know, she, then we'd have this distance in our relationship. You know what I'm talking about? And so then uh, the pain I would inflict in her would cause pain and woundedness in her. And she would then in some way inflict an equal amount of pain in me and I mean we were set up and um, 
and, and one of the things I know about God is this, is that I remember the night I gave my heart to Jesus and I was changed, but my personality was the same. God does not, is a respecter of persons and he doesn't tamper with your personality. But the Holy Spirit seeks us to be whole, seeks for us to be whole. And so as I was converted spiritually, what God started doing was working a change in me emotionally and I became aware of the woundedness in me that was causing me to do things as an adult that was damaging her and make a long story short we could spend a whole evening talking about these things but as God began to heal me on the inside in my perfect no we got in a little spat last night uh, she's in Ada so I can talk about this and uh, she didn't leave mad. Uh, Drake is singing in the church this morning doing a solo. Uh, but I can say more because she's not here and you won't tell her. And no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But we're not perfect. But I came to this point in my life where I said, God, God healed me of the past. And I was able to get down on my knees and say, God, forgive my arrogance. For thinking that what had happened, what I'd done, the accomplishments and all that had anything to do with me. It was you. And I invited God to be Lord of my life and let him carry the burden. And he healed me. Or he is healing me. And so I don't know what your need is. But here's what I do know about God's healing is it comes out of his strength for surely he, this is Isaiah 53 part of it surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering the punishment that brought us peace was upon him by his wounds we are healed by the head that bore a crown of thorns and bled by the back that bore a splintered cross by the side that was pierced with a sword till the blood and water gushed out, by the hands that had nails driven through them. The hands of the king are the hands of the healer. Healing happens. And we are not in control of our lives. And what do you need to be healed of today? So I've asked Harry if he would be back at this worship station and Dick Lutz is going to be here, and Jay is going to be over here at this worship station, and I'm going to be over, over here. And if you want to be prayed for, for healing, then we're going to do that this morning to pray for you that God would provide you what you need in healing. And so we're going to play and worship and sing. And if you just want to come and pray, you don't, you don't want us to pray with you, that's fine too. You respond as the Holy Spirit leads you, and let's stand as we worship and we'll be in the four corners, and if you want us to pray for you, we'll be here. <laughs>